Hi everybody, welcome to Talking Automotive with Mark and John. My name is John Sinclair and my co-host Mark Pellevestra. Hi John, today we've got Mike Sinclair, the Director of Content and Editor-in-Chief from carsales.com.au. Mike really gives us the inside mail as to what happens inside the journalist world in the motoring business. Uh, he has some great insights on where he sees the industry going and what his projections are for the next decade. But also shares the machinations as to how everything works that I dare say will be news to a lot of people, even those that have been in this industry for a long time. If you like what you see in today's episode, please click the bell below and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Reach out to us, leave a comment, or reach out to us on LinkedIn to John Sinclair or Mark Palavestra. We're definitely keen to work with you and share any more information that you have. Yeah, really great discussion. So let's jump into it. With 30 years experience in auto logistics and state-of-the-art locations in five major Australian cities, Precar Fleet Services is an independent division of Precar Services, offering specialty fleet fit-outs for commercial applications ranging from simple tray and tow bar fitments to fully bespoke service body and accessory installation. With quality assured safety, compliance and standardisation of vehicle builds, Precar Fleet Services are a premier all-in-one solutions provider for commercial vehicle fleet operators, leasing companies, and original equipment manufacturers. For further information on how Precar Fleet Services can assist in solving your commercial vehicle fit-out needs, please visit precar.com.au and click on the link to Fleet Services. Mike, great to have you on the show. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. It's a real privilege for us to talk to you today. Maybe just to kick things off, can you tell us a little bit about Mark Sinclair and how you fit in the whole uh, car sales business? Sure. Well, my official role is Director of Content and Editor-in-Chief for the Car Sales Group. So uh, my team basically produces uh, most, if not all, of the content you see on the Car Sales Network that isn't advertising. We do produce some sponsored content as part of our spectrum of content that we deliver. Pretty much everything that isn't a car for sale is built or brought to you by my writers and uh, videographers, etc. And a question for me, Mike, is the independence of the motoring media. Uh, there's been a lot of conjecture around media, etc., and and cash for comments. Is there a lot in this market as far as the automotive journalist perspective? And how do journalists handle that? Oh, look, it's a really good question, Mark, and and it, and it's a bit of a can of worms that we're opening up there, but but happy to talk to it. I think over the last few years, there's been a huge change in the ability for the barrier to entry to producing content in cars has really, really dropped probably in the last decade, but particularly in the last five years. So what we have is we have a whole bunch of outlets that maybe are not traditional uh, automotive outlets or haven't come through the tr traditional media houses or those sorts of areas. So they all have diverse business models. And I think on one hand, it's great that we're getting so many different voices talking about the automotive space. But on the other hand, maybe the transparency that uh, we would have assumed through major media houses and, and major, major automotive outlets, maybe that's got lost along the way a little bit. And there certainly seems to be many businesses out there or automotive content outlets that don't necessarily have a squeaky clean business model. You know, I've attended many launches and they've been at, you know, fantastic events. Can you tell us about some memorable car launches and where do you see the future of car launches? Sure. Look, I, I, I might tackle the first bit first, John, in that, in that I, because I think that certainly through the COVID period, um, you know, from through 2020 and into 2021, We've seen a massive change from the OEMs in terms of how they launch their cars. There was always a trend to digital launches, but it tended to be sneak peeks or a first unveiling for vehicles. But certainly through the COVID period with the lack of the ability for people to travel, the, you know, the, almost the, the cessation of international travel, those big international launches have not been taking place in, in the real world, but they have continued to take place in the virtual world. You know, a car launch typically would involve uh, for a large, say, you know, something like let's picking picking one at random, say a new Golf 
would typically involve hundreds of journalists from hundreds of outlets around the world driving the car in one place at one time over maybe a period of four to six weeks. Now, that content may well be embargoed or it may have, um, you know, it may be open slather from day one. You would get, a manufacturer would get a whole bunch of um, content produced and hands-on, people having hands-on experience with that vehicle. Uh, we certainly haven't seen that in the last um, 16 months or so, or you know, 12 to 14 months or so. And we're probably unlikely to see it for another 18 months or whatever. And whether we actually go back to that type of launch will be, will be an interesting um, thing to discuss maybe, you know, as we get the pandemic under control globally. But certainly uh, those sorts of um, large, high-profile vehicles are being launched virtually now. We're seeing uh, perhaps a, uh, a presentation, um, a, you know, more produced presentation, the executives and engineers talking as they would at a normal launch, but talking to a global audience. And then probably what we're going to see more of is very small numbers of vehicles moved around the world so the journalists and the outlets can experience the vehicle firsthand in a, in a reasonable period of time. One of the things that was changing international launches for the Australian market was the fact that Australia was becoming a market where cars arrived quite early in their life cycle. So maybe um, five or six years ago, it might take six to nine to 12 months for a new vehicle to make it into the Australian marketplace once it was launched in Europe or, or the US, particularly Europe, obviously, without, without vent to the brands that we like as, as buyers. But, but now... You know, in the case of BMW, in the case of, uh, you know, the Volkswagen Group, those sorts of things, sometimes those local launches, sometimes the cars are arriving here, you know, with literally within weeks of them going on sale in Europe. So that was changing the landscape as well, and will continue to change the landscape going forward. So as far as the, uh, the big budget launches, uh, you can see them coming back still, or is that going to be sort of parked? There may be a return to some of it, but probably the, the question that we'll be asking as a, major outlet in this country is can we afford the time now to spend people you know spend uh, you know somebody being out of the office for a week to attend a uh, an international launch when um when we've proven for a significant period of time that that maybe that didn't hamstring us as much as um, as much as we thought so i think it will depend on on uh, what other outlets do, well a what the manufacturers decide to do and then from my point of view what other other outlets decide to do in terms of how much resource they put into international launches. You know, from Australia, even if it's only a one-day one, a one day launch in, the, in Europe, it's still pretty much a week out of somebody's calendar. And that's an awful lot of time for somebody to be able to go and, albeit spend time with, uh, with some of the key um, decision makers on the vehicle's development, but it's still an awful lot of time to spend on one vehicle. So I'm guessing the uh, the trip back on the plane is feverishly typing the story up on the laptop uh, with the, uh, the the drinks table sitting there and uh, with, with your meal and uh, typing up the story. Well, it's, it's often it's often it's um uh, it's not even that uh, Mark. Often that the deadlines are such that that's being produced you know literally uh, back in the hotel room before you even get back on the plane. So it really depends on the on the individual situation and, and where those deadlines or embargoes sit. One of the things about moving, you know, the largest automotive outlets online is that there is no magazine deadline, there's no print deadline. You know, your deadline pretty much is as soon as you finish driving the car. That's got positives for consumers, but it's also got negatives in that, you know, maybe people don't have the time to actually sit there and and uh, really. Um, ruminate on how important the car is what the value you know what the the key strengths and weaknesses of a car is in perhaps in a in haste to get some of the content out so um, sometimes embargoes work well in that regard where, where uh, you know we might have a week to produce the content the other thing that complicates all this of course is video so um, consumers uh, are, you know desperate to get more and more video so producing video is one of those things that um, takes some time as well with the manufacturers, and uh, John and I've worked with a, with a couple, and, and Mike, we've been, had the good fortune to work with yourself on a, on a few of these. But do all manufacturers engage with the motoring journalist fraternity in the same way? And what would be your example of best practice? That's, a, that's another really good question, Mark. I think one of the interesting things is that um, if we go back a step, the, the value of earned media has changed in the last um, decade or so. 
for many, many years, the P way of manufacturers to get their messaging out was to inter interface with, um, you know, you had two, two options. You could advertise or you could work on, uh, on the basis of earned media, earned, earned uh, reputational media through, through key outlets. Obviously, those two options still exist, but in the middle, you've got the, the ability for manufacturers to talk to consumer groups and grab consumer groups via modern media uh, much more readily perhaps than they did in the past where they, were, they had limited advertising options. What's interesting is many manufacturers still really value the earned, earned media, really value the, the opinions and the, and the content generated by um, experienced journalists about their vehicles and about perhaps their, um, their uh, next generation of what they're doing, uh, their, their key values, their key brand pillars. You know, they still talk a lot about that with, with journalists and engage with journalists like that. Some other manufacturers um, probably on a sliding scale of, you know, might move to, to the other side where they're, where they're quite prepared to buy the ability to talk to the general public via either via influencers or do with direct messaging and direct um, channels of, of communications. We always work on the basis, or I've always worked on the basis that the, the, the important things about a, 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 a new car or, or a brand is, you know, what we say as, as, as automotive experts, what you say as a consumer and what the manufacturer says. After all, it is their brand. So there's three voices there that um, have, have value to the end user. And, and the, the sliding scale of where that, where that moves and who's doing how much where really differs from, from manufacturer to manufacturer and from segment to segment. And so the, the is it good practice for the manufacturers to get, say, yourself and your peers? And is there a lot of cross-pollination amongst the peers and discussion and you know, critical debate about, well, we're on a launch, what do you really think about that transmission shift on that car and versus the engine performance on this car and all this sort of stuff? Is there, is there that interaction between the peers or do they keep pretty much themselves? Oh, I think there's a lot more of, um, of people keeping to themselves, particularly given the, the um, competitiveness of the auto landscape. But there's also a lot of um, you know, open and, and uh, uh, timely interaction with OEMs where, where often, often we'll get to sample a vehicle, um, you know, an off the record sampling of a, of a vehicle, for instance, before it's ready for release. And, and that, in that um, situation, we're able to offer some feedback of, on certain aspects of the vehicle that maybe the manufacturer's engineering team wants to build, wants to build into that final stage of development. Pretty much when a vehicle is, is built and ready for release via an international launch or a local launch, well, that's all baked in. There's not much changing from that point. You know, there, there might be some very, very minor tweaks, but the cars are being built the manufacturers are, are pretty much stick, stuck with the impression we're going to deliver. Um, do some manufacturers maybe, you know, lobby for, for certain results? I'm sure they do. Um, but, it, but it's probably a, a demonstration of the expertise and the maturity of the, of the media involved on, on how much they take on board what a manufacturer is delivering in terms of messaging. One of the challenges, I guess, in the current media landscape is whose opinion you can trust and whose opinion maybe you need to you need to put a little bit further down the down the scale, and um, and obviously um, you know we've with the move to a whole different spectrum of media outlets, you have everything from really committed um, brand ac you know acolytes or or you know um, brand fans producing uh, content all the way through to probably the the crustier um, more. Um, more wizened um, auto journalists out there. So, so you know, if if uh, if you're looking at a um, at a outlet that's maybe um, a fanboy based outlet, you're probably going to get a different result from one that's you know maybe a more um, um, centrist um, type outlet. Motoring journalism for things like getting readers, getting advertising, uh, getting to the top journalists to come write for you. Sure. I mean, Australia has. Um, has a fantastic reputation for producing quality automotive journalism. It's probably the UK and then um, Australia and then perhaps Germany as, as, the, as the key sort of um, uh, the toughest uh, auto, auto journalists um, typically. And, uh, and so um, within, that, um, 
within that environment, competitive, it is quite competitive. I think there's more, um, I think there's probably more um, and quite a collegiate um, relationship in terms of that competitiveness. It's not necessary, you know, it's not a, it's not a destructive competitive competitiveness in, in, in my opinion. Certainly I haven't found it to be that in, um, in the almost 25 years I've been doing it. But um, there's certainly, you know, the desire to be the first to break a story, it's a new story or the desire to, to have, um, you know, a strong performance in terms of your content, in terms of how many people read it and, uh, you know, what sort of, um, you know, visitor numbers you can get. That's, that's absolutely real. And um, there's also, uh, you know, the new, the whole online space rewards um, um, speed in terms of uh, getting stuff published. Obviously, um, there are aspects such as, um, you know, SEO, search engine optimization, that, that you get genuine benefits for getting content up that um, is, uh, is first. I, I guess the flip side of that, and the unfortunate part of that is it doesn't always mean it's the best. So the, the, the Google machine in terms of, uh, of how it works from an SEO point of view um, can be uh, manipulated in many different ways. And that is something that comes into even to the point of how people write headlines and, and write you know, their content. Um, so often you'll, uh, and if I just give you a little example, if you were writing an article for a, um, for a magazine, you might um, talk about a, you know, the, a Porsche 911 Turbo S, you might write, you know, the first time you mention it, you might mention that it is the latest Porsche 911 Turbo S. In, uh, in, and then the second time you might say, you might say the new Porsche or the Turbo or the 911 or the, you know, the Turbo X or, well, in online journalism, to make sure SEO works well, every time you mention that car, you'd have to call it the 2021 Porsche 911 Turbo X. So for the poor reader, sometimes those sorts of things get in the way of flow of good copy, but it's just one of those things you have to do to, to make sure that you, uh, you do get those benefits from uh, from how online works. And as far as attracting journalists to the industry, you, you mentioned before that there, there, there seems to be less barriers for the enthusiast to come in and just start a blog and way to go and tell a story. Is there like an apprenticeship, like the in the old days, that you'd start off uh, as the uh, as the copy reader or, or or the process where you, you, you get the, the graduate position at, at the the media outlet and then work your way through and, and I'm guessing it's a pretty prestigious thing to be able to be the a, a motoring journalist where you get to experience so many amazing things so is it hard to get those people to uh, to go through that formal process or is it a, a total different game now I think it's a totally different game now Mark and, and you know I'm not suggesting for a minute that, that it, the whole game shouldn't have moved on but um, you know there's certainly uh, places in the world where there are um, there are degree courses involved in, in um, automotive journalism. Certainly, there was there were some running in the in the UK for a while, where it's actually a proper um, degree and traineeship in type of journalism. It's certainly never been the case in this country, and I don't believe it's the case in the US. And if I look at my team, it's probably a mix of trained journalists and um, and enthusiasts who have come through the ringer and basically learned their trade, uh, you know, on the job. I started in. Um, I started uh, as an enthusiast in a motorcycle magazine. Um, I've had no formal journalism training for my entire career, but uh, you know, I was taught by very good people and taught by people who were really good um, proponents of, of journalism and, and, and magazine publishing. Um, of course, then we all learned online publishing um, together. Some of the some of the, the reduction of the barrier to entry is, is, a, is more a positive than it's ever been a negative. Um, the fact that people can see uh, an opportunity, create content to fill that niche or fill that opportunity and, and build a, a hobby or in fact a business around it, I think is fantastic. Um, I guess the flip side of that and the thing that you know, we've spoken about is that people just need to be aware that not, ev not every bit of content is created equally. You know, that certainly um, a business like car sales, if I was to produce content of the inflammatory type that some outlets feel like they, they need to produce, then I don't think myself or my team would have that full forum or the ability to produce the content for, for very long. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that whole um, hierarchy of uh, 
of outlets and that hierarchy of content is 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 earned, but is but is also evolving. And the impact that's had on the digital side, and also influencers. You see, uh, Mark and I have had a lot of debate about because they're not really journalists. They don't really produce that much content, but they have good following, and a lot of brands are using them now. Social media is a huge part of what we do now. It's a huge part of the footprint of, of any media outlet, of any you know, automotive or otherwise. Um, it's a way of uh, directly accessing your consumers in a really time critical manner. It's a way of talking to what your brand's about. It's a way of engaging different types of audiences, depending on the social media platform you use. It's uh, to, to quote somebody else, it's a hungry beast in terms of, you know, um, there are more and more social media platforms that you need to look at. You need to um, make sure that you're across. Um, and there's, you need to make some hard choices along the way about, you know, what you can do well and what you need to go by the wayside. And, that, and for any um, uh, editor or any, any, uh, any journalist, it's, it's quite hard to think that you are not able to necessarily do everything you want to do in, in one go. But... Um, so we, we take, at Car Sales, we have um, um, a, a social media strategy for each of the different types of social media we, we um, work with. Obviously, Instagram is very image-based um, social media, and it's all about, you know, how great cars look and, and you know, some of the wonderful details on those cars. And you engage a totally different audience there than we do, on, you know, in our various um, Facebook channels, and we have various Facebook channels that do different things. Um, in terms of influencers, influencers is, uh, you know, and the, and the OEM's um, engagement with influencers seems to, seems to differ markedly and seems to have been evolving and waxing and waning substantially um, over the last, you know, couple of years, not even withstanding the, the COVID time. The type of audience you get, the type of outcome you get from, from your spend, I guess um, I guess that's really a, a very much a individual automotive out, or individual automotive brands decision making process will be very different. The key thing to remember in any influencer um, content or any when you're looking at an influencer is that for the majority of them they're paid to produce that content. In terms of um, awareness, then many manufacturers obviously see that influencers are important for awareness, but in other cases it's um, from a, what benefit do I get as a consumer from influencer content? You know, that's something that really will depend from, you know, influencer to influencer and the type of content they produce. Um, there, there are influencers out there, um, particularly, um, uh, you know, in Europe in the automotive space where they have, you know, you can't ignore the size of their audience. They have a massive audience. Do they actually sell you any cars? Um, do they actually inform your consumer in terms of key um, attributes to the vehicles or those sorts of things? Probably not, but, the, but they still um, deliver uh, a significant amount of um, airplay for your brand and for your, and for your new product. So that's why manufacturers don't ignore it. I, I always think that the key influencer that we talk to and mainstream automotive outlets talk to is the is the guy or girl that in the corner at, at uh, every party who who's the car guy or girl, and who the um, you know the family or friends ask about their next car purchase. So if I can continue with our team to talk to that influencer, and have that influencer be a, um, a you know a um, proponent for what we do, then um, then we're probably doing a reasonable job, and I think automotive brands, if they can have that influence on site, that's also probably a... Because if your big main influencers are big followings, they're probably easier to identify. But the person sitting in the corner and that is like your enthusiast. Yeah, well, they are your enthusiast and, 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 um, and some brands probably um, um, shy away from engaging enthusiasts because they're looking for a larger number of people. But... But that enthusiast will still be an important um, proof point for any purchase for their family and friends. So I think I think that's where mainstream automotive and and um, and and you know even you know also still print you know 
automotive magazines, car magazines, uh, certainly um, play a role in, in staying connected with those people. And I think that's why car magazines, even though they're going through a tough time at the moment, will probably still always have a place because, um, you know, they do engage that, that team, uh, those sorts of people. You know, from my point of view, we want to, we definitely want to engage that sort of enthusiast person, but we want to do, we also want to keep um, people in the, uh, you know, who come to car sales to have our content approachable and easy for them to consume, if the, even if they're only coming to research a car even, you know, every five or six years. So that's why I guess we have a probably a more diverse writing team in terms of a mix of male and female, a wider group of ages that many of the, many of the more traditional outlets. Um, and that's why we try and produce and evolve our content look and feel fairly regularly to try and make sure we're addressing the needs of those sorts of mass market consumers rather than and, you know, without without alienating enthusiasts and, and the subject matter experts that are out there. Now, Mike, what are the main pain points in your industry? So the car, auto guys often, some brands adore journalists, some brands have, have concern with journalists. So but we can get an understanding of what are the pain points for the, the motoring writers in your business? Yeah, in, interesting. So I, I think, look, I think the... If I can answer this in a slightly different way, I think one of the biggest issues that OEMs have and car companies have is many people within their both their um, executive teams, in their um, factory teams, in their dealer teams, don't actually drive any other product. So they they are you know they are often um, are extremely opinionated about how good their product is, with probably not necessarily the base of information to support that from a pain point point of view often or you know sometimes the pain you get is when you have um, brand b or brand c or the dealer of brand b or brand c or the marketing manager or the pr manager ringing up and saying how can you possibly say that about our car compared to that car you know our car does this this and this um, when they've never even driven the other car when they've never experienced the other car that's a that's a that's a pain point it's a frustration on a totally different level, the you know a, a frustration that we're experiencing, I think the industry is experiencing generally, is the probably the um, dumbing down of the communications between manufacturers and, and journalists. Perhaps where um, manufacturers had significant resources resource in their PR teams, the PR, the PR executives typically reported through to the CEO. Um, you know, were quite quite. Um, had quite a lot of sway in the, in the C-suite at those OEMs. Um, with, with a number of manufacturers now, PR and the, inter, and the interaction with journalists is just seen purely as you know, a part of the marketing mix. That's probably a more um, esoteric pain point for us, but, but it's, it's certainly, I think, in the, in the next few years will change, um, will continue to evolve how some OEMs interact with media and interact with earned media especially. Question for me is the whole future of automotive. We're seeing major changes happening with electric vehicles coming. You've got agency models coming in terms of distribution. We've just seen hold and leave Australia. Where do you see the future of automotive? Uh, and then what aspect will motoring journalism play in that? It's a massive question, John. It's a massive, there's, there's so many um, things to unpack from that. I mean, if we look just purely at a, at a product point of view, uh, you know, we've had a, a century where, where the, the main solution was a petrol engine, um, you know, where that was basically, the, you know, certainly different types of cars built in different, you know, engines at the back, engines at the front, pushing the wheels at the back, pulling the wheels at the front. You know, there were lots of different, different types of petrol engine vehicles and, you know, and I include or combustion engine vehicles. We're not, we're going to evolve over the next, you know, probably 50 years where we're not going to have one single um, platform that's going to suit every purpose. Uh, heavy duty trucks and perhaps long distance, you know, commercial vehicles may go to fuel cell. Urban transport may be EV. You know, in the middle, there'll be a, a couple of generations of hybrids and various levels of, of um, you know, range extending modes, whether it be 
you know, plug in and a small engine, um, performance cars with with uh, plug in and a big engine. You know, the, the, there are so there's so many moving parts in all of this. There's no doubt that in certain markets around the world, we'll get a, we'll get quite high penetration of, of pure EVs. Um, but in other markets, particularly like Australia, you might see that that penetration is um, eroded a little bit by personal buying tastes, by people's perception that they need more range than perhaps they really do, um, by the ability for Australia maybe to become a, a leader in um, in synthetic fuel production. You know, there, there's there's so many different um, scenarios that will will dictate the type of vehicles we have here. Obviously, they're going to all be imported. I think the um, the horse has bolted in terms of um, car production coming back to this country. So we're going to we're going to have what we what is developed around the world. Um, so that's another factor for the Australian automotive space about going well. Will will the type of vehicles that Australian buyers want will they be produced by the number of brands perhaps that we have in the marketplace now? So you know, does that mean there'll be less brands? Does that mean there'll be um, you know? Um, and what does that do for the whole retail footprint? Certainly from our point of view, in terms of you know, car sales as an online business, we work with a whole range of, or work with essentially with all OEMs, and we're gonna have to um, you know, look at how those OEMs change their, their uh, path to, to retail. Um, and we'll have to, we'll have to create, and we, you know, we will create um, products that suit uh, you know the interface between consumers and OEM. So um, you know we haven't even talked about car sharing. We haven't even talked about um, you know the various mobility solutions that manufacturers are, uh, are talking through. So there are so many really fundamental changes that are going to come to the automotive world in general and and in Australia as well. As to what part we play, well. Um, it's certainly going to be an interesting decade or so in terms of what content we produce. You know, what do we write about? How do we educate consumers on, um, you know, even basic stuff on the, on, uh, well, if I go back a step, the, you know, consumer, many consumers are really, really scared of the move to, to electric cars. You know, that is it going to limit their mobility? Is it going to limit their ability to go places or see people? Um, where, where, you know, the, we know that that space is rapidly evolving. So we need to find ways of conveying that messaging to, to consumers to, uh, to give them the information they need in, in simple, understand, you know, understandable language. The, there are so many different um, technologies that are, that are being developed now, you know, autonomous cars, the, you know, the semi-autonomous um, functionality is already in cars, amazes people when they get into a modern car for the first time. Now I'm I'm driving a, um, a mid-grade Hyundai i30 um, this week, and uh, and the amount of autonomous technology that car's got in it for for you know less than thirty thousand dollars is uh, is mind blowing. Um, so you know there'll be plenty of things for us to talk about, and uh, and we need to play a role in making sure that consumers know about all that stuff. That's uh, really profound stuff there, actually, Mike. It's, uh, when, when you summarise it that way, it's, I, I very briefly took a few notes with that one there because I'm keen to put that in, in the summary and just to see if I've got that right. But one last question I'm keen to ask you, and I've, I think it's one that you're a bit passionate about, uh, and most OEMs that bring product in from, say, North America or from the European markets, uh, one of the biggest frustration is right-hand drive products. So keen to get your thoughts and what's your take on the debate for if Australia, this island nation, we can keep COVID at bay, should we migrate to be left-hand drive? Uh, another great question, Mark, and, and, and it's one that we've done um, a couple of things on over the years and we've, all, you know, we've opened up the debate with the readers and it's, and it's amazing how spirited and how passionate they get about it. You know, there's, there's a couple of things we can write stories about. You know, um, uh, uh, you know Commodore, Commodore versus Falcon always used to be huge. That's evolved to being Mustang versus anything else. Um, if we talk about road safety and anything to do with cycling, people just become apoplectic, which still does my head in because, you know, I'm a passionate cyclist as well as a passionate driver. And that whole thing about more recently about right versus left-hand drive. There's still a large part of the world that's right-hand drive. Um, you know, it's certainly not as big as the, um, the market for left-hand drive vehicles, 
Uh, I guess the short version will, will be that at some point in the future, notwithstanding the, the arrival of fully autonomous vehicles, which, which I think we all agree is probably a lot further away than the maybe the press is, you know, the, the general vibe is suggesting, then um, we, will, we will get the vehicles we're given from the overseas manufacturers. And I say, I mean, I say that not, not flippantly, but you know, if, there is not a, if there is not a strong, um, consistent demand for right-hand drive vehicles, Around the world, if you know, if if uh, if other markets go, if other markets, you know, Japan, for instance, if they were to uh, uh, allow more left-hand drive vehicles or all those sorts of things, then it could be a case that that um, right-hand drive production, you know, really starts to wither on the vine. I'm not sure that's actually going to happen. I think there will still be um, key manufacturers that still see a key opportunity in right-hand drive markets, but it may not be the 50 brands that we have now. You know, and in, in fact, it's highly unlikely it'll be 50 brands. Um, you know, we will see, we're going to see a contraction of brands, I would, would have thought, over the next decade, just purely from the economics of moving to a more EV-based production process and, and model lineup. And we may see um, that as, long, as well as the brands um, contracting in terms of total numbers globally, and there'll be more of a contraction here also as as um, some, you know, some brands don't see the value in having a, you know, a, a full operation here or indeed even having um, an, an importer agreement. So I don't think practically any government would make the decision easily to change just uh, to left-hand drive, but I think that there could potentially be a situation where it happened, um, but that's a long way away. But I see as the, it becomes more competitive, all the brands are really struggling. Margins are being compressed. And that's why you're having all these brands having to amalgamate. And I think the left-hand drive might be just eventually the next thing that comes. They just can't afford to spend the, the, the money on, on the development costs to do right-hand drive. Yeah, look, I, I, and that's certainly, certainly a consideration, John, but I think also as we look at um, the more modularity of, of, say, electric vehicle or, you know, EVs where there's, there's less engineering required to mirror a vehicle, um, then, you know, that, that will probably save the, save the right-hand drive vehicle. Uh, but, yeah, it's a really interesting viewpoint. Um, you know, it, it's, um, and as I said, people are really passionate about it, about, um, you know, how, how would we do it and if we could do it. I know it's certainly been a discussion with um, some some senior automotive identities, you know, in, in the UK and here. It, it's one of those fun things to consider, but I think it would be a, uh, a massive undertaking if we were to, to to do it. And then, you know, the the thing that people bring up is what would then be the net, net benefit? Because we would still have a um, a regime where vehicles still needed to pass ADRs and those sorts of things. So it wouldn't necessarily overnight mean that we had a whole bunch of other vehicles available to us. Uh, yeah, perhaps one of the considerations also is cars have more autonomous functionality and those sorts of things. You know, maybe maybe there's less problems with having a left-hand drive vehicle on a right-hand drive road. Um, you know, lots of lots of different scenarios I can see being thrown up. I actually drive my Camaro. That's in the uh, the intro is a 68 convertible uh, Camaro left-hand drive. So I drive that on, on the, uh, the left-hand side of the road. So it's, uh, it's, just, it's, it's an acquired taste when you get used to it to start with. You don't sort of migrate to the middle of the road and have all this car uh, going the right, on the wrong side of the road. But once you get in the groove of it, it's, uh, it, it's second nature. Yeah, and I think it's not like we're throwing, having to throw coins in a, um, in a tollway basket anymore or anything like that so, you know so, so there are probably um there's probably as i said scenarios where where left-hand drive vehicles could be made available here whether it be you know maybe in reduced volume um you know certainly you know from a from a performance of supercar point of view or those sorts of things i know there's been pushes to to allow that sort of uh, importation and, and operation on roads so look you know it, it, as I said, it may may no longer be an issue if if, uh, if autonomous uh, um, pods all of a sudden um, take over the world and uh, 
all we're doing is getting out and sitting in a in a uh, in, the, in the back seat of one, then it really becomes a moot point. So, what happens then to the automotive journalists if they're autonomous pods? Good question. I don't think it's something I'm going to need to worry about. But the um, uh, look, I think the reality is that there will always be a requirement or a, a, a desire for people to have personal mobility that involves some sort of action from their own. Now, uh, the the time, the, the window of time to move from currently where we have, you know, 99% of the vehicles on the road are being driven by, are being driven by somebody, you know, notwithstanding the, the fact that there is self-steering and those sorts of things in them already, but, um, you know, the number of users, the number of buyers of those new vehicles are actually use that functionality is still very small. Um, notwithstanding that, you know, the migration from a fully um, driven environment to a partially autonomous environment um, is, is going to take, you know, decades. It's, it's gone from the point where there was significant amount of positive comments about autonomy from, from car manufacturers, you know, in the mid, you know, 2015, 2014, saying it was here, it was coming in 2020, um, to the point where, you know, in 2019, Mercedes-Benz effectively walked away from building autonomous cars, they would say, they said they will have autonomous functionality, but it's too hard in a light vehicle environment. And they were, they're, they're devoting their autonomous um, budget effectively to heavy vehicles, so, so platooning of trucks and those sorts of things. Uh, and if, if Benz, which is one of the biggest spenders of, um, of R&D in the automotive space, if not the biggest, if, if they're saying it's decades away, then that's good enough for me. Mark, thanks very much for your time today. I think it's been really interesting getting a better understanding of the whole journalism and how you're evolving with all the changes. And I think also getting a good understanding of where automotive market is going, because I think it's there's some really interesting points there. And it, as you said, there's so many moving parts. Uh, Mark, do you want to do a summary? I hope I can do, do justice to, uh, yeah, there's a lot of pressure here. We, we're talking to one of the preeminent automotive motoring journalists in Australia. So it's a bit, there's a bit of pressure here. So hopefully I get this right, Mike. Thank you once again for coming on the show. It's, uh, it's been fantastic just hearing you share your wisdom in the, in, the, in, in the motoring journalist space. One thing that really resonated for me, and you made the point that this decade is probably going to be one of the biggest decades in the auto industry from a change perspective. I've been in the industry for four decades, maybe a little bit longer, and there was there were a few changes. We had a bit of LPG came in, diesel sort of came in, SUVs came in. You've highlighted something that really is quite profound, that this is a huge decade of education. And the word that you said very early in the piece when we talked about independence of motor and media is transparency of the media outlet and their information. The, the motives for the information, sources of information, and also their skill in how they're sharing it. And the one that resonated for me was, whose opinion can you trust? And this is where, with this significant change, with this technology that's coming in, can you in, rely on an influencer who happens to wear a certain amount of clothes that has a long, large follow on Instagram to say, hey, this car's good? Or is it that you need to go to the respected storytellers of this world, aka yourself and your organisation, to tell a valued, detailed story uh, around what is this technology? Because you've made a point that I, I thought was really uh, a profound one, is that people are scared. People are scared of EVs. They're scared of autonomous cars. They're scared of these different technologies that are coming out and and there's going to be a lot of change because we're used to filling up petrol cars and maybe a bit of diesel, but now there's going to be a whole range of EV, hybrid, plug-in hybrid, and hydrogen fuel cells that are going to be totally different again. So where do you go to get this information? And I, I share your optimism that there, if there's really one place for this truth, and that is through a credible motoring journalist fraternity. And this is where you highlighted the manufacturers that actually recognise that and engage with you at the appropriate levels. So you, you need to have access to the MD. You need to have access to the, the senior executives, the sales directors, the marketing directors, well, this is, and the product uh, directors. Is This is where we're going. This is who we are. This is what we stand for. And you also mentioned before about the uh, just the, the challenges that you face, which is, you know, the whole 
you got to be really quick to get that story out. And first is not necessarily the best, but they're all those challenges. So you've actually got a really tough gig to be informative, trustworthy, but also get the information out quickly so that you do beat the filter of the, I won't say the fake news, although the noisy news that isn't necessarily correct. So when I look at the, the work that you guys do, it's, it's actually a lot more complex than what uh, I think a, a lot of us in the industry realise. And you do actually have quite a few challenges, but also a massive responsibility uh, on rests on your shoulders and your organisation to educate because it actually it helps all of us in the industry get the story out there. So thank you for your time today and sharing in a very frank discussion uh, those points because it opened my eyes, John, and came for your thoughts. No, definitely, Mark. To me, it's really fascinating. And I think even though we spend a lot of time in the industry, it's only when, Mark, you sort of summarize all the different changing points that you actually start to think there's so much happening and it's all happening at once. And we just don't know what the outcome is going to be. I think it's a fascinating time to be involved in it. So thanks very much for your time. I really appreciate that. Absolute pleasure. It's uh, very enjoyable. It, this decade right now is probably the, is going to see the most change. Absolutely, Case. And I think the other thing that, you know, we see all these headlines about, you know, most recently Jaguar going all electric by, by 2025, you know, the UK banning we read that they're banning petrol engines in by 2030, when in fact what they're doing is they're banning non-electrified vehicles. So there's a fair bit of noise around some of these things as well. So you know, we, we need to read between the lines of some of these announcements and going, right, what is really happening and what is that timeline? Um, how, does it, how does it affect a consumer? So if you're buying a car now, and we have consumers that ask us every day, if I buy a car now, will I be able to get diesel in five years? Because they see these headlines, they see um, the, the noise out there that's saying, you know, diesel cars banned from X. So um, certainly our marketplace will, will trail some of the European marketplaces. But the reality is that, for instance, if I go into the most recent announcements with Jaguar, so Jaguar will be an EV brand from 2025. But the last um, combustion engine Land Rover that will be built, Land Rover is saying, or Jaguar Land Rover is saying, will be in 2036. So, you know, that's a long time away. And, um, you know, the, the devil's in the detail. When you, when you hear from such a senior motor and journalist and leader in an organisation of a very significant publication or, or outlet, when he outlines the responsibility that actually rests on those organisations, but it actually helps all the OEMs, because it, it means that you, there's only so much you can say in a 15 second ad. And if nowadays have 30 second ads are ready. So a 15 second ad to say, well, hey, this is what uh, EV looks like. And the, this is why it's okay. And your range is this. So it's that whole storytelling that isn't the manufacturer. It's all the things that Carl talked about in his podcast with us, Carl Woodford, when he talked about that earned. It's that earned respect and trust, but also it's that earned right to tell the story. And all of us have been programmed since we're little kids to listen to stories and love stories and want to read, hear more stories. That's pretty powerful stuff. To me, what was fascinating is, is he was talking about the scaling back of the PR person. But then on the other side of it with what, he's, what Mark was saying, it's quite interesting because you should actually be scaling up the PR person to make sure that the content, the education, everything you're trying to do is both right for the journalist and also for social media and, and everything you're putting out. So you should be uplifting that role and, and putting more importance on it because if you don't, you're just going to be putting out the very basics of what your product is and then you, I think you'll lose out in, in the long run. Definitely some key learnings for me is even with his organisation, with car sales being the big juggernaut that it is from a media perspective, that they he uses with his team a different channel and, and story that he tells on Instagram versus the detail in Facebook. So lots of images and picture tells a thousand story, a thousand words on Instagram, but Facebook is more a more detailed storytelling process. And then obviously the website then takes it to that other level again. 
But yeah, very, uh, very uh, enlightening discussion. And interesting his views that the on the you know, the potential rationalisation or change in composition of the brands uh, status quo that we've had for ten years is changing, and we're already seeing it now. With a couple of brands already uh, flagging, uh, well, Holden's gone, and some other brand brands are you know, making a few changes on along the way, and there's other ones that are going to come in. So it's ebb and flow with a big techni- technology disruption. Because I was also quite fascinated about the discussion on left-hand drive. Because to me, I always thought, uh, I think right-hand drive just is not going to survive. But then having a look at what you're saying about the engineering costs and that for EV is going to be reduced. So it might actually help right-hand drive survive for longer. That was really very, very interesting for me, and I had never thought of it that way. It might, if right-hand, left-hand may be a mute point when you go to autonomous anyway. When I recall seeing autonomous cars back in 2012, 2013, and there was a steering wheel in the middle because it was basically a pod that was going to commute the users around, and then that steering wheel would eventually disappear. There'd be no steering. It was just going to be an autonomous pod. So the whole drive program may be a very unique thing. F1 seats, that's it. Thank you for listening in today. Hopefully you got as much out of the discussion with Mike as we did. If you liked what you saw, please click the uh, the subscribe button below, like us and on YouTube, and also like the link on LinkedIn. If you have any questions for either John Sinclair or myself, Mark Palavestra, please reach out to us via LinkedIn or leave a comment below. Uh, we look forward to your feedback. And if you need any other detail on anything in relation to the auto industry, please reach out. We're very happy to work with you. Yeah, thanks very much for listening. We'll talk to you next week.